So I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, I'm Gabriela Martinez. I'm Director of Education at the Museum of Latin American Art. And on behalf of the rest of the staff here, I'd like to welcome you to MOA's Asian Pacific Islander Latinx Festival. This is our third event in which we explore instances of cultural synthesis between Asian Pacific Islander and Latinx communities in the US and throughout Latin America. We're especially grateful for the programmatic support we've received from our festival partners, the Pacific Island Ethnic Art Museum and the Japanese American National Museum. MOA also counts on the support of the Robert Gumbiner Foundation, the Arts Council of Long Beach and the city of Long Beach. We are honored to host today's program, Detention, Resistance, Japanese American and Latinx Histories of Incarceration, featuring three California based artists. And now to introduce our moderator, I will hand it off to Joy Yamaguchi, Public Programs Coordinator at Janum. Hi, thank you so much, Gabriela, and thank you, Mola, for your partnership and support. It's been just so wonderful to be able to um, work together and, um, yeah, really, really great to connect across our communities and come together for this important conversation. Um, so I just wanted to say a brief welcome and thank you to everyone who's here and um, a little plug for Jana and just let you know that we've just opened up our doors for the, on the weekends. So we would love to see you there um, and look forward to when we get to visit MOLA soon as well. So I'll put more information in the chat for that. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to our art director and VP of exhibitions, Clement Hanami, who will be leading the conversation today. So we can jump right in and hear from our wonderful panelists. So pass it over to you and take it away, Clement. Thank you, Joy. Um, I wanna welcome everybody to today's program, Detention, Resistance, Japanese American and Latinx Histories of Incarceration. Today, we are gonna be speaking with three amazing individuals with diverse life experiences. We hope that through this discussion, we'll be able to explore the interwoven stories of resistance and community power that emerges during times of intense struggle and pressure. Um, just brief bios of each um, individual. Joy will also post their full bios inside the um, chat. Um, first is Jesus Barraza. He's an interdisciplinary artist who creates prints and posters that visualize the struggles for immigration rights, housing, education, and international solidarity. He's co-founder of Dignidad Rebalde, um, a graphic collaboration, arts collaboration that produces screen prints, political posters, and multimedia projects. He's also currently a lecturer in ethnic studies at the department of UC Berkeley. Um, our second artist is gonna be Shizu Saldamando. She's a Los Angeles based artist who is, well, she's originally from San Francisco though, but she has exhibited locally and internationally and whose work experiments with a broad range of surfaces and materials, including tattooing. And, he doc and she documents the subcultures, many of the subcultures of Los Angeles. The Japanese side of her family was so originally from Boyle Heights, they were imprisoned at Santa Anita Racetrack during World War II and then Roar, Arkansas. Um, and her, the Mexican side of her family is from Nogales, Arizona. And then our third speaker is Kazumu Julio Cesar Nagunuma from um, Peru. He is the son of Iwaichi and Isoka Nagunuma and the youngest of eight children. At 20 months old, his family was kidnapped and imprisoned at the Justice Department camp in Crystal City, Texas from March 1944 to 19, uh, September 1947. The attorney Wayne Collins and Reverend Fukuda from the Conco Church were responsible for their release um, and they were able to stay in America because of that support. Um, and he is the creative director and principal of NDD Creative. Okay, so with that, what we, this is what we all came for is really to hear these three speakers talk about their um, connections to the topic of today. So first, cause, um, can you talk about your um, relationship to the, the ideas posed to, in today's um, public program of detention and resistance? No, well, I'm not as active as uh, many of uh, my friends, to be honest, but uh, um, in 2019, um, we took a trip to Crystal City, Texas, to go back to the camp. Uh, during that trip, um, uh, we also went to Laredo, Texas. This is a border town. To, um, Joy could put up the pictures. 
this is a community center um, called Holdings. Holdings is not the, it's not literally used as Holdings, but it's the name of the person that uh, uh, put the community center together. Anyways, uh, the key person to really recognize here is uh, uh, Professor um, uh, Sasuke Ina. Uh, she put this whole thing together, a trip to Laredo, a trip to Crystal City, a trip to Austin, the uh, capital of uh, Texas, to uh, meet with the legislators, and also a trip to Dili, where they have the detention camps there. Uh, she's um, one of the leaders in our community, a uh, very smart lady, uh, a friend of mine. And uh, without her leadership, I wouldn't have been as involved. I really didn't know what was going on, but this particular trip to Laredo was uh, moving because what they arranged was to have our group, there's about 20 of us, tell our story to several of the immigrant families. This holding community center is a place where these families are getting ready to get into the, their lives here in the United States. So they give, give them shelter, they, they shower, food, all of that before they go out. And to listen to their stories, we basically shared our stories and uh, uh, this is the first time I was really moved out of everything that we did because it was interpreted and she told our stories to them and they told, uh, she told uh, their stories to us. One story in particular, uh, one of the photos shows a mother and a, her uh, younger daughter uh, from Guatemala and um, uh, they were, in turn detained, I should say, and they took their 18 year old daughter away and she was asking why. And the board of people just said, well, she's 18, so she's old enough to take care of, her, take care of herself. She didn't know what they did with her. Um, what was also moving for me was to hear them speaking in Spanish. Um, I could almost hear my older sister I have three sisters, um, they're, they're quite a few years older, 15, 17 years older than I. I could almost hear their voices when they, uh, I was listening to the, them speaking Spanish because of course the, my sisters all spoke Spanish. That hit home about what this country has done. And um, this is what the former administration, it's getting better now, as you know, but, um, that was a uh, memorable trip and the um, key was for us to share our stories with them. The legislators in Texas uh, do the protests in Delhi and to visit our friends in Crystal City. So Kaz, maybe you could speak a little bit more just about the connection between Laredo, Delhi and your grown, where you grew up. Well, I was, uh, mostly in San Francisco since I was five years old after we were released from camp. Uh, the connection is really through, uh, again, um, Sasuke Ina. Uh, she heads the Tsuru for social diary and that's what, um, uh, we were actually gonna do this uh, trip in uh, middle of 2019, of course, COVID hit. So they'll have this trip again and uh, they're supporting and, and really getting the word out about detention. Her work is about the detention of uh, uh, the children. Right, right. But but Laredo is where you were living from 20 months to five years old. Uh, Dilly. No, actually, no, it's actually Crystal City. Right, right. Which Laredo is, is, is a couple hours away. Okay, yeah. Dilly, I should say. Yeah, Dilly is about an hour away, roughly, yeah. Okay. Um, but close enough, um, right. uh, we couldn't get close enough, but we did a protest there and uh, that was meaningful because they again detained children there and families a lot longer than they should be. 
um, they're probably the, Delhi is probably the largest detention camp in, in the country. Cause, can you speak a little bit about um, the fact that you are Peruvian from Peru, Peru and sort of the struggles that you had to do with, um, or the struggles that Peruvians have with redress? Uh, yes, you know, the I, this, this is just, the Japanese American and the Japanese Latin Americans all struggled. Um, in camp, it's one thing, but when we got out of camp, it was probably the hardest. Um, my family, my father and mother didn't speak English. Um, they couldn't find work. Uh, we, the oldest two, three siblings helped to um, put food, food on the table. Um, the first few years was really, really hard. Um, as the years went on, it, it got better and better, but it took a long time and the redress came about and we were fortunate. Our family had the right papers to, to get the redress. Uh, my sister went up to the gentleman that was speaking at the community center here in San Francisco uh, about redress. This is back in um, the eighties and um, she showed him the paper and on the spot, he said that um, you, you qualify. What it is is a paper that shows the FBI arrested and we, each of us have that piece of paper that says we were arrested, but it's just a technicality. In other words, we were fortunate and we also connected with the redress folks here in San Francisco and they helped us get involved in we were one of the few families that received redress. The unfortunate part is, of course, my mother and father had already passed away. They are the ones that needed it the most, and they never got that. We, you know, Reagan's a, a letter of, of apology, none of that. So the struggle keeps on, and you don't really know this as you live day to day, but as time passes, even when I was trying to collect my social security, I was told I had to have an original birth certificate. Well, just so people know, we were given three days to pack up where they boarded us, put us into the a ship that took us to Crystal City, Texas. This is from Callao, Peru. And I had no, I had a negative of um, my birth certificate. So something basic like that, becomes a problem. Uh, so from childhood, my brothers, the two brothers that are still living, and one of my sister started school and they couldn't speak English. So that was really hard for them in particular. I started as a kindergarten. So it was a little bit easier, but the struggle is in all different areas. Language itself is a problem. We spoke Japanese and uh, Spanish. But, but, but no English. How do you find jobs, meaningful jobs? Uh, how do you get by each day? It was a, really a struggle. And I give all my other credit to my parents because I, I really don't know to this day how they made it. Especially my father was already 56 years old when he came out of camp and he had seven children. Uh, I don't know how we even found a place to live. So the struggle continues all the way through, even as an adult, and uh, like this birth certificate thing. You know, I, I was fortunate. My sister had a contact in Los Angeles. He's a, uh, a, a writer of a newspaper, and he goes back to Peru regularly. So he was able to get a original for me, um, certified, and so that's what I brought to the uh, Social Security office. So. There's many aspects of, of life. And you know, we used to have to report to the immigration office once a year before they was more frequent. So it, there's no, nothing uh, calming or, or you, you can put your feet on the ground when you're put into this situation. Uh, so my, and then I, being the youngest in the family, I think I was the luckiest 
but everyone else, especially my older siblings who came from a very good life in Kayal, they already graduated from high school and all that. So they, and, and my parents were um, wealthy and had a good life there. So they went from there into camp and had nothing. So it was much, much harder for them, especially even after camp, everything was taken away from them. Okay, thank you, Cause, for that sharing that moving story. Um, there is more on Discover Nikkei too, um, that Cause has, has gratefully left for us on our website that you know, we can always access. Um, okay, I'd like to uh, move on to Shizu. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Shizu since 2009. I think I knew her even before then. Um, and way back, not way back then, but she was always an amazing artist doing amazing things. And so one of the pieces that I had curated into a show was something related to this. Um, it's an in installation that she calls Excavations, an interactive experience which honors her fam family history of incarceration. So I'm just going to ask Shizu to talk a little bit about how she talk more about the piece and how um, her approach in honoring her family history through her work. Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Kaz, for your story, for sharing your experience and your truth. Um, is does Arturo have the visuals for that project? So um, I don't know if you can scroll it like or to center it, but um, so I'm primarily a portrait artist and I do portraits of friends and family, um, people that I hang out with at different like musical like events or social circles and settings. And I kind of view um, my work as like a, a personal narrative um, documenting um, community and documenting ways we can be transformative creatively. And I view um, this project as an extension of the portraiture work in that it's documenting and exploring my own familial history and the subculture being um, Japanese Americans who've experienced in, um, internment incarceration um, during World War II. And uh, I was inspired to do this work, this body of work um, around, I think, 2007, 2008, I'm not sure. Um, there was a, I guess when, when you're graduating, um, school the the limited there's limited amount to show or limited spaces to show or opportunities and and as a latinx chicanx um artist i was um there's a lot of day of the dead shows and uh, my uncle had just passed away so i wanted to do an altar for my uncle akiniwa who um had just died and i wanted to honor him um and talk about his history and my own family, my um, my mom and my aunts, my mom was conceived right outside the, right after the camp, or she was conceived inside the camp. I don't know how that happened, um, but was born right after. And my aunts and uncles and grandmother and grandfather were all in rural Arkansas. And um, so my aunt married uh, her husband. They met in the Sawtelle area after they moved back from Chicago, but um, he had just passed on. And I remember walking through the Janum exhibit and the, one of the um, tour guides was talking about how the flowers in the photographs of funerals and different um, community gatherings in the camps were done by, or in the prisons were done by, um, they're made out of paper flowers. And there's video footage too at Janum of people, community members coming together in the camps making paper flowers because real flowers were not available um, or anywhere in these barren landscapes that most of the, the, the prisons were at. So um, people had to make paper flowers. And I found this um, publication at Janem's library, um, E. Ray to the excavations of the Manzanar Cemetery. And they had documentation of all the artifacts that they excavated from the cemetery at Manzanar. And that included um, lots of wire remnants, um, glass bottles that were once vases for these um for the, the paper flower bouquets and um i knew i wanted to do a um a paper flower wreath for my uncle as part of the that project as for the ex the exhibition the day of the dead exhibitions that i was doing um so i made this wreath out of a really fancy japanese washi yuzen paper 
Um, and I used a pattern that was also found in the Janum archives of a, I think it was Sears Robux or Woolworths uh, catalog. They had inserts. That's where everyone would buy everything that they needed was through these catalogs. And um, it wasn't an origami pattern. It was um, from there and it was a rose pattern. So I used that to construct the, with the wreath. And then I drew, if you want to do the next slide, I drew um, images of the wire remnants that were found that were once paper flower bouquets that they excavated from the cemetery. And um, so that was the first project. And then I revisited this project in 2016, right before um, Trump was elected. And I was asked to do a project at the Smithsonian Asian American um, Culture Lab in DC. And I wanted to make this project interactive where people could sit down and talk to one another. You can go to the next slide. Um, so I could share my experience, my family's experience um, being taken from their homes and put in prison, um, not being allowed to really bring anything. Um, and what that did to what that did to them and my family and the, the post-traumatic stress disorder that they all are under um, the traumas that they kind of like have gone through in their whole life because of this being in jail and as children, as a whole family, the abuse that my grandfather undoubtedly like um, bestowed on them going through that trauma too. Um, and so this was an opportunity for me to talk about that experience, but also to teach everybody, all the participants in the workshops, how to make this paper flower pattern that was found at the Manzanar camp. Um, that was actually from a Sears Robux catalog. So we'd have these different um, flower making workshops where people would come in and I would teach them how to make this flower. And then we'd add it to this communal wreath sort of to call attention to 2016, right before um, Trump was elected. Um, so I, there was still a chance that he wasn't gonna be elected. So I really wanted this story to come out because he was banking on this um, xenophobic kind of platform that a lot of politicians do and are currently and have always done. And um, I just wanted to share that history to sort of talk about, hey, we, we really need to learn this history so we can prevent it or um, make people more aware of not letting it happen again. Um, but it, it continually does, and it's still going on. Um, sort of the scapegoating of minorities, immigrants, um, Black and Native people um, are targeted by our current system and have always been. And we seem to just be fine with putting everybody in jail. Um, but these racist systems are still still in place. So I wanted to talk about that and, and a politician using that as a platform for their campaign um, and how awful that was. So it was a very personal story. So it was people were more receptive to hearing about it um, and that my family went through it and it's sort of in the history books accepted as an unjust act. There are certain acts that are currently in the process of um, being written that that are even worse <laughs> that are kind of overlooked and seen as normal or even justified. So it's it's interesting how um, that's changed. So for the next slide, we did this, uh, another project. So these are the finished communal flower wreaths with the participants. And in the background are some of the excavation, some of the flower patterns that were found and the, the archives that I used. Um, you know, on the next slide, I think that's another flower wreath for the next one. Uh, so we made two of them and in the background there's some more um, wire remnants that were found in Manzanar. And then the next one is um, the, yeah, the next slide you can go there. So this one is the beginning of um, another project that kind of piggybacked off of this project um, was done in Hawaii. My husband's from Hawaii and his family um, was from Honoululi where the um, Oahu Detention Center was. And since there's so many people in Hawaii that were Japanese descent, they couldn't incarcerate them all. So they picked certain people that were like leaders of the community, et cetera, and um, prisoners of war, et cetera. So you put there. And um, he had a, his family owned a flower of lay making, a lay making business. So for this project, I took different um, executive orders. So you have the Chinese Exclusion Act, um, the Executive Order 9066, the Japanese American prison camp, and also um, the Muslim travel ban. And we ripped them up. And if you want to go to the next slide. So I asked participants, again, to come in and help me make this. And we, we ripped them up and we made uh, lays out of them. So sort of trying to twist, because Trump had already been elected at this point, And the 
Muslim travel ban was being instated. And so it was sort of a way to talk about the different um, executive orders and government, government um, sanctioned or government policies that targeted uh, immigrants and people of color um, as they still do today. And if I think the next slide is the finished lay or the lay in progress, I'm not sure. Yeah, so that's the finished one. And that was an image of this uh, little girl. I think her name was Rebel. I'm not sure, but she was um, at a anti, um, anti-Muslim travel ban march. Um, so it's Japanese Americans against the Muslim registry and to call attention to the way immigrant communities um, can stand up for one another um, and also honor, honor those different voices. Um, so the next slide is a, uh, I think, the, you can go to the next one. That's us making it um, at the workshop. And this is the last one I did. And this one is dedicated to the children and families that are currently um, incarcerated in the detention centers on the border, the immigrant detention centers um, that house mainly Central American and Mexican Americans, um, and also a lot of Caribbean, um, not Americans, but Central, um, yeah, and uh, Caribbeans too that are being held. And I think it's just important that we realize that um, these systems, um, or designed are specifically under this uh, white supremacist um, umbrella and our and our government is and it's they're specifically targeting people of color um, native people of color and uh, it's it's still going on and I think there is currently there is an abolitionist there's always been an abolitionist movement to try to really um, excavate, I would say, and really examine and deconstruct these ideas about the prison system in the US and how they how they're unjustly um, unjustly dolled out, and how we really need to address this and how um, if we really want to make expected change, and really um, make sure that this type of stuff doesn't happen, continue to happen, um, because there are currently so many children still in prisons right now under the Biden administration. Um, how can we really think about difference, uh, think about ways to um, defund and funnel money into preventative programs rather than just more prisons and more unjust white supremacist systems of, of um, incarceration that have kind of plagued and, and been the foundation of this country um, since its inception. Um, so that's, uh, my project. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. She's been, um, mm -hmm. It's an amazing project that's obviously spanned many continents now. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any, I, I know you've already shared a, lo a lot of great connections and overlaps, but are there any stories of Japanese American or Latinx, Chicanx uh, solidarity and resistance that are important to you? And, and does this framing of detention and resistance, is that something that also something you feel is resonates with you? Yeah, well, I just, I, uh, yeah, there's always, there's countless stories of solidarity and, and people um, supporting each other um, when people were shipped off, um, families and neighborhoods um, t watching over people's property sometimes, taking their, um, their like watching over their things for them while they were gone, um, people housing, people in secret even, um, like certain married couples um, that took care of each other. Um, there's there's a lot, there's there's so many. Um, I think, I'm sorry, what was the second part of your question? Like about... <laughs> the concept of detention and resistance, sort of our theme, is that something that you yes. feel resonates for you? Yes, I think it's so important to, as, um, as non-white people um, that are existing in a government of white supremacy to have these conversations and to really acknowledge the commonalities and the threads that we've all kind of faced and who's been targeted more and have stand up for them. And, and, um, and also it's not, not necessarily, well, what about us or what about our stories, but also like, hey, these are all different stories that we need to acknowledge and talk about and, and really address and, and, be educated about history and and what's actually gone on. I mean, you have people like Yuriko Chiyama who who actively worked with the Young Lords and 
um, Malcolm X and who actively understood this going through her history to see that how important it is and how many how much stuff we have in common rather than well what a well we need to do this for us and we need to do that for us but it's not that it's like we need to have these community building and and have these threads and recognize commonalities and common struggles that we all have and really unify and and really address um, the way that our, our current prison system targets communities and black people and brown people um, disproportionately in our prison system today and how how that relates to the Japanese American incarceration in World War II and how we really just need to um, analyze that and develop alternative modes because it's it's not working. The current prison system has never worked. It's just more prisons, um, more violence, and it's 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 a defunct system that needs to be overhauled. Thanks. Thanks, Shizu. Thank you. No, thank you for sharing. I mean <laughs> and and the penal system even in the communities, you know, it, it starts even before their people go to jail, the way the laws are implemented and how people are categorized as bad people, even when they're still in, in, in their own right. communities and policed in such unfair ways. So um, thank you so much for sharing those thoughts. Um, and now we're going to move um, to Jesus. Um, and, you know, and, and you know, coming off of sort of what Chizu was talking about, Yuri Kochiyama, you know, this sort of respect for the elders. I know that Jesus has spoken very highly of sort of like the Royal Chicano Air Force. And, you know, he has a lot of respect for the history of Chicanx and Latin Latinx um, artists and creators. And he's sort of the new guy carrying the baton. Well, not the new, he's actually been doing it for a long time, but mm -hmm. he's the guy carrying the baton now for, for the movement. And it's just, an, he's such an amazing guy. He's part of Dignidad, Rebelde, uh, Rebel Dignity, um, and its purpose is to reflect people's righteous resistance to all forms of domination and control. And so um, just want to have him talk a little bit about um, if he can reflect on that, on, on sort of what their group does and um, some of the many of the interesting ways that they work with community in, in, in sharing these ideas. Cool, right on. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, yeah, there was a time where I could say I was I was a young guy, um, and now, now I'm I'm slowly becoming the old guy. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's a hard. But you know, I want to just a little bit about our art. You know, for me, it always goes back to this. This this is a couple of the portraits I do, just to give you a sense of the kind of art that we make. A lot of it is based on portraiture. A lot of it is based on this whole idea of solidarity, and so we have. Uh, these are portraits of Dolores Huerta and Stubico. Um, for me, it's always about uplifting those those people in, in our history who are most often not taught about in, in, in our, through our educational system, right? Until you get to college and can take ethnic studies classes, right? And so just a little bit, this is me, my partner, Melanie, and we have this project, Dignidad Rebelde. Um, this is a little bit about us. You know, we believe that art can be an empowering reflection of community struggles, dreams, and visions. And we follow these two principles of Chicanismo and Zapatismo. We produce art intended to transform people's stories of struggle and resilience into a radical vision of language that is then returned into return to those who inspired it in the first place. So, you know, it's, for us, we like to make art and put it back into the hands of our community, making sure that they can see themselves in that art, right? Because we live in, an, in, in, a, in a world where art is many times um, not reflective of our own experiences and, and struggles, right? So to me, this is really like what we do with our art. And, you know, when we think of Chicanismo, right, just to expand on these topics a little bit, it's, it's really about the sense of, as we used to say in the 90s, uh, sisters at the center. It, it's it's taking from um, scholars and intellectuals like Gloria Anzaldúa, Sherry Moraga, Ana Castillo, uh, women, Chicanas, who, who put forth a way of thinking that not just centered women, but also looked at it from an indigenous perspective. And to me and to us, that's something that's really important. And, and that is also kind of comes up in the, this, this idea of Zapatismo and the Zapatistas are an indigenous army um, in Southern Mexico and Chiapas uh, who actually went to war with Mexico and, and as a result kind of came up with uh, 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 an autonomous struggle. Uh, now, you know, 25, over 25 years later, 
there in Chiapas creating autonomous communities. And so for us, um, that is a really big part of this because what, what we're thinking about is we're thinking about uh, autonomous indigenous communities, right? What does that look like here in the US, right? That looks like for us here in Oakland, you know, thinking about, you know, myself being here in the Bay Area and San Leandro, this is, you know, this used to be, this is and will always be um, a lonely land. You know, now it's, it's occupied, but we're thinking about how this is, you know, land that is, 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 was being taken care of by a certain population and through colonization is something that was taken away, right? So we're looking at that, right? And, and trying to understand what does that mean, right? And I think this all come, kind of comes back, right? Uh, as I'll kind of get into a little bit, but uh, a lot of our art is, is, is dealing with issues in our community. And so these are a couple of pieces that we did. Uh, this is um, a piece that was done about Oscar Grant uh, after a, a year after his, uh, he was killed by BART police, right? Um, the other piece was done with uh, a, a friend of ours uh, uh, on Trayvon Martin, kind of dealing with, with his life. And um, like, you know, just to give an example, this is how our work is put back into the hands of people. Uh, the Trayvon Martin piece was was put out into, we screen printed it at a community center. And then we went out to different rallies and marches and gave them away and, and put them in people's hands, right? Um, and I think, you know, although this is in a different way, dealing with the carceral system, right, with the prison industrial complex in a different way, right, um, but our work is, is a lot of times dealing with it um, very straightforward on this is a piece that I did uh, early on during this is kind of the, the COVID era, right, as, as we were still dealing with, with what was happening. Uh, I, I read in the LA Times that ICE was still doing uh, raids, right? During the, during the early period of COVID, they were they were ordering masks for their um, for their officers to go out into the field and 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 block people up, right? And this was one they were being shamed of, like, how are you ordering all these masks when when um, hospitals are having such trouble ordering them, right? And so you're you're kind of taking them that supply, but more importantly, right? We're taking people off the streets and and putting them, you know, people who are already um, dealing with a lot of issues and putting them into these, these overcrowded populations as you kind of see in the background of this poster. Um, and so a lot of my work kind of deals with this, right? What does it mean for us to be um, locking each other up, right? Um, as, as human beings, right? I mean, I think going back to that, and, and this was another piece that, that we did, just kind of thinking about the prison industrial complex. Uh, this was done for um, a, a drive, uh, a kind of convoy that, that went to Santa Rita uh, and we printed the, these posters and, and, you know, thinking about what it meant for people to, um, to be locked up during this period, right? I think as it says, a sentence shouldn't be a death sentence, right? And so these, these posters were printed, screen printed and, and passed out at different rallies and, you know, taken to, to drive around, right? And so to me, this was, you know, a little bit of kind of the background, but to me, it's, you know, how do we, you know, think about, you know, abolition from this perspective, right? Because I think I'm gonna stop to share. Um, for me, it's been about considering, you know, as an abolitionist, considering what forced incarceration is about, right? Um, considering a place of decolonization and reconsidering racist histories, right? This is, you know, means a lot to, to look at this from, you know, from the history in the Americas, right? When, when we look at what happened at, and with Japanese internment, right? We can look back to here in California with the building of the mission systems and the way that uh, the indigenous people were, were basically pushed in, pushed into forced labor to in the in the same ways, right? To build the the the, the system that was oppressing them to finish the the, the mission system in the same way that um, Japanese folks were, were forced to build their own places of internment, right? To finish the, the construction of these places, right? So to me, it's like when we look back on this, right? We're thinking of this from a uh, black indigenous people of color kind of perspective um, that that looks at at this prison system, right? This, this way of, of thinking, right? That That is about subjugation and control by the settler colonial system that's been put in place, right? And so we see, you know, Japanese concentration camps um, as kind of a, this, 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 this result of white supremacy, seeing racial differences as alien um, and a reason to lock people up, right? This kind of, this process of dehumanization, right? Um, 
So, we, you know, we see this kind of as a continuation today, right? We see this with the prison industrial complex, right? We, we have these stories where it's, you know, the people paying a debt to society, right? And, and to being reformed, right? But really it's, it's a whole process of dehumanization um, where we think of, you know, the way that, that people are fed with, with rotten food at times, the way people are locked up in solitary, forced into, into inhumane conditions where people actually just lose their minds, right? To right now thinking about, you know, as I was mentioning, you know, people being locked up during a pandemic. And this has been a huge issue, right? I have a, a student in one of my classes whose brother got locked up uh, earlier, in, in, in earlier this year and within a month uh, contracted COVID. So, you know, when we look at this, it's like we're thinking about how these systems are, are dehumanizing. And even when the community, when the, the larger population brings this up to the, to the prison system, like, hey, this is, you know, you're killing people. It's like they really don't care. Um, I mean, same thing with, with ICE, right, with ICE and the detention centers that are, are run for profit, right? Um, people are, are, are getting locked up, being subjected to these COVID conditions and and it's it's sickening to see what's happening right and it's 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 crazy because we we can look at this for me it's just always like I said it goes back to a white supremacist perspective of of uh, using prisons as a form of basically of sub subjugation and control and we look you know I think thinking about what's happening in in Palestine today um in terms of of the Israeli state and the way that they're oppressing people there, we can look to um, the prison system there, right? Where it's not just, you know, we, we look at political prisoners who have been locked up there and it's not just men and women, but it's also out of, out of 4,400 prisoners that are being held, 160 of them are children. And when we think about this whole process of dehumanization, it's not just about them being locked up there, it's also about them being tortured both physically and psychologically with the point of, of it to, to, to really to break their spirit and to, to put them into a place where they no longer want to fight for their homeland, right? And so to me, I look at this, you know, as this, this you know, uh, thinking back to, to Japanese internment as, as, you know, part of this, the, these tools of white supremacy to control populations, right? That it's deemed uh, their existence to be transgressive. Right, so their, their existence is, is, is just an on its own transgressive, right? And so it, it's a way to control them, right? And so to me, it's always about how do we build a sense of solidarity based on the impact of imprisonment um, that our communities have lived through, right? And, and so this is, you know, I think as, as, in, as important as, as a Chicanx person to look at, you know, what Japanese people went through as a way of, of building resistance and building solidarity amongst ourselves to, to be able to look back on these experiences. To be able to consider who we are and what we've had to deal with and how we can learn from those things, right? Uh, I think that's, I don't know, that's, uh, can we that's end going the over my time limit. Can we, can we end the program here? No, <laughs> <laughs> I, I really, that's, that's so awesome, Jesus. You know, I'm, I, a, a friend of mine asked me, you know, like a year, talking about like, why aren't there any like rich and famous Japanese American artists? You know, and then I think of the the educational system that a lot of us have to go through. You know, and you know, it's it's about avant garde. It's about individuality, uniqueness. You know, it promotes this sort of Western ideal of what art is. But then I think about the work that we do at the museum, working with artists like Shizu and stuff like that. It's like you said, indigenous way of looking at the world. You know, our art is not about look at me. I'm like famous. It's about how can I help this guy? You know, your work, your posters are international. You know, you're not just, you know, you're not Bay Area. Your work transcends borders. And so I'm just curious if you can talk a little bit about sort of your way of nurturing community and how you collaborate with different people. You, you mentioned Chicano feminist theory and stuff like that and how you work with other people. Yeah, so for us, I mean, it, it really goes back into this whole process of, of being part of community. Um, for me and my partner, Melanie, um, when we make art uh, with community, we, we, we try to work with people that we know. I, I think that's, that's a big part of us being uh, here in the Bay Area community. We've, um, we've been here for a long time and, and we're artists, 
uh, but we're also community activists. And although our main thing is in community organizing, we work a lot with different people in the community. So that's really the base of what we do. We, we, we'll always work with, with new people, but for the most part, it's been, you know, how do we build these relationships with people as, as organizers, as activists, right? And then be able to work with them. And even when we meet new, new people to work with, that's, that's a big part of it. We, we try to build that relationship and try to make sure that as, as artists, we're, we're invested in what they're doing. It, it's hard to, to make art about something that you not, don't feel passionate about, right? So like when working with, with Courage on that piece uh, about Santa Rita Jail, right? We, um, it's, it's an organization that we've worked with for a long time. We've done um, exhibitions at, at their spaces, right? So when they, when they called upon us, you know, they, they wanted to know if we could do something. And so for us, it's, you know, it, it depends. Sometimes we're working with, with bud act budgets this time we really weren't working with much of a budget other than than having these pieces printed um had a friend print them and so i wanted to make sure that they were able to get paid and so that's always a thing making sure that artists get paid right uh, or printers or, or whoever is helping to work on the project but it was about you know working with them and working in collaboration with them i think uh this was during COVID time so we were doing everything over the phone and and going over ideas right going over ideas of what what does it mean to make a graphic um about people who are being uh, put in, in jail, right? So it was, we're trying to make uh, create an image that will reflect those people to make sure that they could see themselves in it. And so that was the, uh, the image of the young man with the bandana over his face, which one, you know, kind of goes to the COVID era and two goes to just kind of this idea of resistance. So that was a, a big, a really important part is talking with them and, and, and talking about the, the messaging, right? Because messaging is really important. A lot of times organizations have their messaging uh, but in, in this case, right, it's always about working together to come up with these ideas, right? So for us, it's been important, right? Kind of talked about the RCAF, the Royal Chicano Air Force, you know, and that was part of their methodology is of working with community and always connecting with them and making sure that you understand their struggles, right? I think that to us is, is a really important piece to make sure that we understand their struggle. And that sometimes means research and, and talking with people and, and even going out to events and trying to understand what's going on so we can best uh, fulfill their, the, the role of, of artists and activists and be able to make something that um, reflects them and who they are. Right? Thanks. I, I, I'm appreciative of the university system, so I'm <laughs> glad Elle has a, has a great teacher. I know she's went to UCLA too, so there, there's a lot of great resources. There are still some of the old guard, but there's a lot of the new guard that can help people. Um, through all these difficult topics, you know, to understand that it's more, there's more than one way to look at the world. So um, there's a question in the chat for cause. Um, and it, it just says, cause, why were you in camp? I know why, but why were you in camp two years after the world, world, world War II had ended? Good question. Um, I really think the government didn't know what to do with us. Uh, Crystal City Camp is a Department of Justice camp. So unlike some of the other camps, uh, when the war finished, people were let go, let, let out. Uh, we, were, um, we were going to be deported back to Peru. And this is when the attorney, uh, Wayne Collins, helped us and other Japanese Peruvian families to be not to be deported. Uh, Peru didn't want us. So there was time, it, it takes time to go through all this paperwork, if you will. Uh, and it wasn't just the Japanese Peru, there were certain Japanese American families that were kept till two, it's two, two and a half years later. And uh, uh, there are different reasons for it. In our case, it was, they, they really didn't know what to do with us. My father wasn't sure if we should go back to Japan. They were war torn and he got a letter. Uh, in those days, there's no phones that's handy to, to call your, you know, his sibling, his brother. So he got it, it not to come, you know. So my, I think my father went back and forth about where and what we should do. And because we, the two options of going back to Japan and back to Peru was not good, we decided to stay here. Um, all this takes time. It's just the way the, the government works. And uh, uh, we, 
And in order to be released, we had to have a sponsor family. Um, that again, doesn't happen overnight. The Reverend Fukuda from Kokun Church vouched for us. And when we got out, he found uh, families that would sponsor us, families that don't even know us, but they sponsor all these different families. Also, you have to have a job. Well, how do you find a job when you don't speak English? And so all that takes time. Uh, but the basic thing is I, I don't think the government knew what to do with us. I mean, that, that, that's a good example of this institutionalized racism where people have create these laws thinking like, yeah, this is a good law. They don't realize there are people that it affects in a negative way and it makes it unfair. So um, I'm going to ask people if anyone has any questions to please go ahead and put them in the chat now. Um, and while you're doing that, all the panelists are back. I just wanted to ask um, Jesus about what I had asked Shizu, uh, if there are any um, Chicanx um, stories of, or, and Japanese of Latino sort of um, stories of solidarity that you can share. You know, I, and it's funny because there's one that um, I had learned about through the History Channel, which is kind of funny, <laughs> where my TV watching pays off. But there's this young Chicano kid during that era, um, Ralph Lazo, uh, who actually ended up getting himself locked up in one of the internment camps as 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 uh, an act of solidarity which i think is such an interesting way you know thinking of you know nowadays we talk about this idea of allyship right and this is like super radical allyship to 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 go in there and it's funny because when he got when he went in there they were like you're kind of dark but they just uh, you know were like okay i guess you're japanese so they just let him in but he was there throughout the throughout the years uh standing in solidarity with them locked up. Yeah, I think this is an, another perspective of what Shizu was talking about, the way that people hit each other, the way that people took care of each other on the outside, but the way that, you know, this young man went in there, I thought was really amazing, you know, and thinking about, you know, how do we, you know, today think of these, these, these acts of allyship, right? Of radical allyship, of being able to be there for each other uh, in these really kind of extreme ways. But I just wanted to share that because I thought it was super interesting. That was totally unplanned. And <laughs> I, will, I will say that Johnny Saki, who, who works in our museum's development department, actually did a full length video of feature film of Ralph Lazo. So yeah, no, it's a great, it is a great example of oh, wow. uh, Japanese Latino solidarity. We also did a show here called Trans-Pacific Borderlands that mm -hmm. brought artists from Peru, Brazil, and Mexico City, and Southern California, including Shizu, um, as part of a, international show to illustrate how a lot of these connections, it, all of their stories are about supporting each other, you know, in, in all of their places. It's just amazing. All the different, I'm, I'm sure we could, this, this program is not long enough. We should have, we should have had two hours for each one of you to, alone, just to talk about all the connections that we can have. Um, so um, I know there's been a lot of shout outs for Shizu about, um, from people saying that I'm also mixed race. I'm so glad to see your, your you know, you telling our stories here and everything. Um, and then I think there's a question. Can you, can anyone please name any Chicanx artists, perhaps created murals in SoCal NorCal would like to share this with high school students? Oh my goodness. That's like, there's like a million. <laughs> just, like, just Google it. I mean, there's tons like I'd specifically on doing specific themes that you want to know or what I mean. Griselda Montoya. I don't know. Um, I mean, I mean, there's just some, some resources like, uh, great Pretita eyes in Mission District, which is, you can Google Pretita Eyes, and, and that's someone who kind of runs the missions in uh, the, the murals in the Mission District. And then, so that's kind of NorCal. In Southern California, like you can Google the, the Mural Conservatory in Los Angeles. And that's where I always go to, to look up all the murals and you, you can find so much stuff. And, and they all have kind of the, the historical context and, and uh, about the authors. And so you can find a lot of cool stuff. Yeah, I, I used to be a roadie for a group named Los Illegals. And their keyboard player, his name was Willie Heron. And so he has uh, murals in the projects on uh, Whittier Boulevard 
and those are really historic. They're they're so old. They're historical. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and Spark and Great is another good resource for any type of murals in Southern California. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. So as far as the the panels, are there in in sort of like closing thoughts? Are there any thoughts that you would want people to leave today? thinking like what is that nugget that you want them to to leave with let's start with um G, uh she's mm, okay um <laughs> <laughs> sorry yeah no i i think um it's important to tell your stories um and to to really actively question um the police inside yourself <laughs> To really consider when you're when you're judging people or when you think oh yeah that person definitely needs to be locked up or ask yourself really what could have prevented that um and why do you automatically assume that punishment is the answer for everything um i think we really need to look within ourselves and really um critically analyze why we're so quick to put people away um especially within our own prejudicial minds and the way we've been brought up in our culture, we've been brought up in, in white supremacist media to be conditioned to think that certain people are just, like Jesus was talking about, like our mere existence is criminal and therefore we need to be policed more. Um, so, and also talk about the ways that we perpetuate that onto other people. And we really need to talk about the way our own anti-blackness, our own inner, um, discrimination and prejudices affect other people and are carried out and are, are we approve these sort of laws that we think are just when they really are just based in racism. Very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Jesus? I, mean, I think, I think she's who said so much, uh, it's hard to kind of go up after that. But to me, I think just in, 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 in just to kind of add to that, I mean, to me, it's really about, um, how do we consider those who are locked up, right? I mean, I think right now, you know, it's going back to, you know, the, the internment camps, right? But going to, to today's, you know, how do we consider those who are locked up here and, and thinking about how can we help them on the inside, right? And I think this is, you know, something that, that spans from here in the US. So like prison systems are supposed to kind of just uh, to prison systems in, in, in places like Israel where it's, it's, you know, torture, right? Or even thinking about places like uh, Abu Ghraib, right? Um, straight up torture, right? So thinking about that as well as, you know, here in the US uh, at, at UC Berkeley, there's a program called Underground Scholars, which is about um, young people who have been locked up and are coming back into the educational system. So it's really about thinking about, you know, what does it mean to come out of that that system, right? To to be able to to get a job, right? So there's been all these things that are, are laws that are trying to be passed about banning the box, about asking if people are, um, are formerly incarcerated, right? And, and the way that they re-enter into society. So to me, it's about thinking about how do we think about people, you know, in 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 lockup and then as they re-enter society and how can we make society more just, you know, thinking of all the things that, that Shiza was saying about the way people end up there. How can we make a, a more just society where we're thinking about people who are trying to re-enter society and, and make a life for themselves, right? Thank you, Jesus. Uh, cause? Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks, uh, Shizu. Thanks, Jesus. Uh, really good to hear your stories. Uh, that's one of the things I'd like to be sure that all of us continue to share our stories. Uh, I do this really for my family, my mother and father. My, all my siblings that's passed away. I still have two brothers that's living there in their 80s. Uh, but that's number one. Number two is to support the um, Grace Shimizu, uh, uh, she's part of the um, Japanese Food and Oral History Project, and they're still fighting for redress. Please support them because to this day, they didn't receive it 70 plus years later. And it's all based on technicality. If you went here, if you went to Canada, whatever, you wouldn't qualify for it. Anyone that was put into camp without due process, without being charged with a crime, automatically she de deserve redress. And if I could just put a plug in to um, 
video that was done extremely well for some uh, that did see it. It's on YouTube. Please, uh, you could type in Then Becoming Now. Uh, it's a wonderful um, video. Not very long, but it's done well, concise. It tells the story of two of my friends and I um, and our, our story uh, of our friendship, but also uh, we were all interned at the Crystal City Camp. Uh, then Becoming Now. It's on YouTube. Um, and I will give a shout out to Emiko. Uh, Omori, Nancy Okai, and the radio station that received the grant, K-A-L-W. Uh, Thanks very much. You know, thank you, guys. I, I want to thank all, all of our three panelists today, Jesus, Shizu, and Kaz, for, for sharing their stories. It's been amazing. Um, there was one comment in the, in the chat that just came in about this idea of while we a lot about white privilege there are also issues of black privilege which i think our artists our participants do acknowledge um but it just so happens that we are talking about latinx and, and japanese so so I, it may have seemed that way but i know that if any of these three people had seen anyone who had been denied power and privilege for for any type of whether it was their sexual orientation or or you know, whatever, but it wouldn't not just be about color, it would be about injustice. And so I think, you know, how, how Jesus had just said, you know, all he really wants to create is a just world, you know, a better, more equitable society. And so with that, I'm just going to close with that, because I feel like that's what I've come away with, with talking with these three wonderful people today. Is that we really had an hour, like it was so short. We can't, yeah. there's so much to address. There's so many things like you can't, I mean, to fit it all into this time frame is ridiculous, but I think everybody for contributing their comments to enlighten everybody else. But I do think you guys did a good job because you're very articulate. And I think the message is very. Sorry, we're still a functioning museum here, so sorry. Uh, okay, so with that, um, I want to thank you all for coming, and we'll see you again soon. Is there anything, Gabriela or or Joy, anything else we should do? No, thank you so much. Um, this was wonderful. I really appreciate you all taking the time out um, to give us your thoughts and share more about your artwork. Um, and for anyone interested in more MOLA programming, you can always go to MOLA.org and check us out. Uh, we will be opening to the public later this summer. Um, and if you're interested in uh, becoming a MOLA member, you can always go online as well. But thank you again to everyone. Uh, thank you to Janum for being such amazing partners. Uh, we could have never uh, organized this event without you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh